crown him with many crowns. Actually, let's do all four stanzas, and we'll do that broader arrangement on the right side of the page for the final one, all right? This morning, I'm glad you've come out to join with us, visitors and members alike. We've prayed that God would send you here, and he has done so, and we're glad you're here. I uh, hope that you've come expecting God to work in your life. I believe that God is willing and able to do that this morning, and I hope that you've come praying that way. Before we do uh, hear from the choir, though, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this day, this hour that you've given us together, Lord, that you've allowed us to come together, God. I thank you for the blessings that you've given us. You've been too great to us. Thank you for those that have made their way out, Lord. I do pray for those that may be dealing with sickness or suffering, Lord. I think of those like Miss Todd and the McPherson family, God, this morning. I pray that you help them. Pray that you touch those that are dealing with difficulties, God. And I pray for those that are joining in with us by the way of the live stream. I pray that you Allow them to be able to enter into the service in the right manner, Lord, and help them to be able to join in with us. I pray for the choirs they sing, those that are, are going to sing. I pray that you help them to sing from their heart, God, and help them to, to worship you in their song and music this morning. Help us this morning to allow you entrance and your uh, will and way into this service this morning, God. We ask for your presence this morning. In your name I pray, amen.
choir comes down, take your hymn book and turn to 549. 549. Let's sing the first, the second, and the fourth stanza, Higher Ground. Stand with me, 549. <clears throat> announcements real quick. Let's do remember that this evening we'll be gathering back into the house of the Lord. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of a special evening tonight. We'll continue going through the book, uh, going through the life of Abraham, but tonight we're going to try to have the Christmas shoe boxes in here, and I want everybody to be able to see. We're going to try to line them up here in the front, and we're going to have a special time of prayer over the Christmas shoe boxes before we get them ready to send out. And uh, for all those that were able to come out and help us box them, I sure do appreciate your help. And I believe we had an enjoyable time, and I hope that maybe next year we can uh, do a little bit more than what we did this year. Uh, that's my goal. I would like to maybe be able to fulfill a few more boxes, and for anybody that gave or gave uh, money or gave possessions or things of that nature, I appreciate all that you did. And so tonight I want to encourage you to be here so you can see all the shoe boxes and uh, keep those things in mind. And then this Tuesday, they're going to be a uh, game night. And I want to encourage all the children in there on Tuesday night to be able to come out and join us for game night. And uh, I know that you'll have an enjoyable time. And then those that are going on the hiking trip on October the 27th, for all, I believe it's open to the young people or to anybody who really wants to go. But there's going to be a meeting, it says, tonight after church. And so keep those things in mind. And then also I need to make mention that if you are involved on the nominating committee, we also need to meet tonight after service. And then next Sunday evening, those who are involved on the finance committee, we need to meet as well. Uh, it's just those things we have to do, and it's that time of year again. And so please keep those things in mind. If you're involved, those you know if you're involved or not. And if you don't know you're involved, I'll catch you before you leave. And so keep those things in mind. I appreciate you being here. Brother James, if you'll pray over the offering for us, brother. Hey.
while Sister Brenda's coming, I just wanted to make a couple quick announcements. We are having a fellowship after church tonight in uh, recognition of Pastor Appreciation Month. I don't know if he knows about it or not, but I think his family does, so he may know. But anyway, we're going to just uh, spend a little time of fellowship and uh, love on our pastor a little bit. So you guys come plan to do that after the evening service. And I think the ladies, I think we're doing hot dogs. Is that right? Yeah. And I don't know if the ones that are involved didn't know what they're supposed to do, so I'll leave it at that. And one more thing, we've almost left out one very important birthday. Somebody had a birthday this week. I think it's Grace. She turned 16. Oh, eight, eight. I'm sorry, eight. Okay, she's eight years old. I'm sorry, honey. I didn't mean to rush you. <laughs> Let's sing happy birthday to Grace. It's happy birthday. God bless you. All right, here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. And many more. Oh 
Right. Right. Amen. 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 Right. Right. Amen. Amen. Right. Anybody else got anything they want to testify about? I don't want to interrupt. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Amen. 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 Upon magnify my Lord and Savior, my creator, my redeemer. Amen. God is so much more than we allow him to be in our lives sometimes. And uh, I'm guilty of that. And I don't let God be everything that I need him to be or that he wants to be for me. Uh, you know, as men or just people in general, we have a tendency to try to take burdens on ourselves and responsibilities on ourselves that aren't ours. I do that all the time. And uh, I tell you, it'll, it'll, it'll wear you down. It'll put you down to the ground if you don't let those burdens go. Let God have them. Let God be able to search for them. If you just guide your path. And uh, I'm thankful that you've led us here. There's something about this church, something about the pastor, something about the people. And I rejoice in what God has done and how he's really helped me to just begin here. Amen. I really think that, you know, you don't even really realize starts preaching, you heard the messages, God will deal with your heart and show you things like that. Right. Well, thank you, Lord, because I didn't even realize that. Amen. Amen. I praise God for that. Amen. I just want to say that I appreciate everybody's praying here and the acceptance of our family. I give y'all glory and praise. Amen. In Christ's name. Amen. 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 Sister Sandra. Amen. Right. Amen. Brother Dale. Right. Right. Amen. Anybody else? Amen. Anybody else? If the redeemed of the Lord say so. All right. If all hearts are clear, I don't want to stop it. If we've hit oil, we might as well just go ahead and keep bringing it in. Right. 
Right. Right. Right. Amen. Right. Amen. All right. Nobody else? Brother Andy, you lead us in a song. Amen. I'm just content to sit over there and listen. Amen. 562, stand with me. Be thou my vision. <clears throat> We're having children's church today. Who's doing children's church? Candy, okay. So if y'all follow Miss Candy out on the last verse, we'll sing. Let's sing three verses, the one, two, and four, okay? 562. Number two, I appreciate the music, I appreciate the testimonies this morning. I think it is necessary that our children grow up seeing that. I believe, uh, that, is, I believe that is necessary. I believe that little Roxy needs to see Sister Brenda thank God publicly. I think uh, little Baron needs to see Sister Sandra thank God publicly. I believe that. I believe that we need to be able to see those things. I think my children need to see their mother Thank God uh, publicly. And so I believe that is necessary. And I hope, I hope genuinely, I hope that if you're in here today and God's touched your heart, that you haven't pushed them away. That, that if you have something to say, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Uh, nobody did anything in any outward manner that would cause embarrassment to the work of God here this morning. And uh, I think that it would be well if you had something to say for God. Uh, don't let that time pass. I have done that before in my own life. Let that time pass and walked away and thought, man, I really did miss an opportunity. I really did miss an opportunity. And uh, if you're saved, I believe that it's all right to praise God. I believe that it's all right. I believe it's all right to thank God. I believe that it's all right to give God the glory. Uh, I, I have no, we, we, we have no problem touting the president when the uh, unemployment rate goes down. We have no problem touting a basketball, baseball, or football coach when a team wins a championship. But we have all the problem in the world touting uh, Jesus Christ when he saved our soul. Something there. Something there. All right. Revelation chapter number 2. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to be able to get behind the pulpit again. I thank you for the sweet spirit you've already sent in the midst of the church. It lets me know that you're still here. 
that you haven't gone anywhere, that you haven't left, that you haven't walked out, that you haven't forgotten us or forsaken us, God, that you're still beside us, that you're still with us, that you still want to come and meet with us, that the Spirit of God is still real, and that the old-time way that we're doing it here is still valid, that the ways of the world and the ways of modern-day churches is, 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 is all a myth, God, that we can still experience you in the way that we worship. And I thank you for that. I thank you for who you are and where you've been and what you've done, God. And I thank you for the fact that one day I'm going to get to be with you. I praise you and give you all the honor and glory. And I ask this morning that you help us as we open the Word of God, that you touch our hearts, that you guide us, and that you direct us, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Revelation chapter number 2, verse number 1. The Bible says this, Unto the angel of the church at Ephesus write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and how thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and has borne, and has, and has, has borne, and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Uh, this morning you will notice that we're back in Revelation chapter number 2. How many of you thought I lost my mind this morning when I started reading Revelation chapter number 2? Uh, as I began to go through my week and began to study and prepare, I, I, can I say, I, I never pull a message out of a book. I never take, I know other men who take messages from other men because they sound good. I can honestly say that I've only maybe done that one or two times and changed it completely. I just don't do it. I like to come to the pulpit with a fresh message a lot of times, at least a fresh message for that congregation. And... I began to prepare and study, and I felt God taking me back to Revelation chapter number 2. And I tried to take the Holy Spirit through the church of Smyrna and say, look, there's a lot of good stuff here in this about this church. But for some reason, He kept pulling me back to the exact same passage in the exact same area, dealing with the exact same thing. And I'm not really sure why this morning, especially after the outpouring of of worship that we have felt already. I wonder why God has us here. Now, when I was in Bible college, I remember Dr. Sexton saying it takes at least seven times before something sinks in. I hope and pray that God does not have me preach out of this passage of Scripture seven times. If He does, I will, but I don't know. But this morning, I want us to look at this chapter again and talk about leaving our first love. Now, it's going to be completely different than last week. We dealt with it last week. We saw the church at Ephesus. And what I believe is that when we look at the church of Ephesus, it's not that the church of Ephesus does not love God. I believe that just as the church of Ephesus loved God, I believe that we love God. I honestly believe that we have people sitting on the pews this morning that love God. I believe that. I believe that you would not be here if you did not love God. I believe that you would not stand and say, I thank God for what He's done for me, if you did not love God. That was not their problem. He did not say, you no longer love me. He said, you have left your first love. You've left it, which means that I am no longer your premier love, or rather you love something else more than me. Now this is easy to do in our lives because we live in such a materialistic world. 
And I began to think about this as a way of introduction because we're going to move and still again with the, uh, with the subject of that candlestick. This morning I want us to talk about the cost of the candlestick being removed. But I believe we have to look at what they love. Now, the Bible, we can go throughout the Bible, we could say, well, maybe they love sin. The Bible says that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Now, that means that they love that darkness, or rather they love their sin. Now, I don't know if maybe there's somebody in here today that has a sin. I don't know your sin. I don't know what you're doing in your life or what you're not doing in your life. I'm not following you around. If I, uh, Somebody told me recently that some, another person refused to come to church because of the fact every time they came to church, the preacher preached exactly at them. And the response was, it's not the preacher, it's the Holy Ghost. I don't know if there's somebody in here with sin. I don't know that. If you're in here today and you're committing a particular sin, a sin that you know goes against the Word of God, what is sin? We all, sin is anything that transgresses the law of God, okay? Let's just write it down and mark it down that you know if it's wrong and you're doing it. There's something within you that says you're wrong. Now you say, but how can someone love sin? Now, a Christian can only find pleasure in sin for a season because there's one within them that takes that pleasure away and causes conviction. Now the world can continue to live in sin and can continue to dwell and live because of that nature is dead on the inside and on the outside. If you're in here today and you can continue to live in sin and feel no remorse then maybe you're not saved. Because I know as a Christian it speaks very loudly, and we'll talk about this tonight, that you can grieve the Holy Spirit. Grieve the one within you. But you say, well, I can't, I don't know about loving sin. Can I tell you how much people love sin? I was in the Lowe's yesterday. I was looking, I didn't even buy, I was just in there walking around. You women, you go to the department store and walk around and look. I go to the Lowe's and I walk around and look. I just like walking around, looking at tools and wood and a miscellaneous stuff. And I'm there on the paint aisle and I'm looking and I come across a lady and she has on her shirt, the reason it caught my eye, she has on her shirt the outline of the state of North Carolina. How many of you have seen these shirts with the outline? Some of them say home. Some of them have a particular activity in it. This lady in her, her shirt had within the state of North Carolina the word beer. Beer. Now, listen. Whether you agree or disagree, the Bible says that drunkenness is a sin. And what this woman was showing was that she was in love with beer. And you're saying that you can't love sin? You can love sin. Now, a Christian can only love sin temporarily. If you're in the world, you can continue to love sin. The Bible says this, however, and you must be sure of this, that when sin is finished, it brings forth death. Maybe not physical death, but maybe an emotional, maybe a mental, maybe a financial, but it will bring forth death. Maybe today there's somebody in here that loves sin more than they love God. Maybe today there's somebody in here that loves the world or the things of this world. John says, neither love this world nor the things of this world. You say, well now, that's a little bit hard. I get it, because I have this same problem. I walked around this morning praying and asking God, God, is there anything in this world that I love more than you? If there is, please take it away from me, because I don't want to preach this message if I love something else more than you. Things. There's nothing wrong with having things. Things, but you've heard me say it before, is everything wrong with things having you, okay? You say, well, what does that mean? I can go back to the Bible, and we're all familiar with the story of the rich young ruler. He comes before Jesus and said, Master, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? Jesus looks at him and says, well, have you kept the law? He says, I've kept it all. From, the, from my youth, I've kept it all. He says, well, one thing thou Lackest. He says, go and sell everything you have and come and follow me. Jesus knew he was hitting the man at the point where it was going to hurt him the most. And this was talking about salvation. 
But I wonder today how many Christians Jesus Christ is looking at today and they say this, one thing you lack. You're in love with the things of the world. You're in love with the things of the world. Now this is easy to do. I recently told you I I had acquired a 14-foot aluminum boat. And I was out, I took it out yesterday, me and Gabe. I was afraid I was going to get in trouble because I don't have letters showing on it. They told me I could ride for 60 days on it. But I wanted to get on the water, and it was raining. You know how crazy you got to be to get out on the water when it's raining? That's just stupid. (laughs) Okay? But I wasn't the only stupid one out there. There was a whole crew of them out there with me. But me and Gabe, we've been talking. We're going to take and redo the whole boat. And if I'm not careful... I can put the love of doing that thing or the love of that thing or the love of being involved in that thing over the love for Christ. I ask you today, is there something in your life that has taken the love of Christ place? Maybe it's not the love of things. Maybe it's not the love of sin. Maybe it's the love of pleasure. Timothy, Paul would write to Timothy and he said this, that men would be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. This morning, you think, well, I'm not in love with pleasure. Well, have you thought about the pleasure or the joy that a spouse brings? I remember when me and my wife, she gave me grief the, the other day. I had a friend sending me pictures of myself from years past, and a couple of them were with my wife, And one of them, she's not in here this morning, was with somebody else. Before we started dating, I will say. And my wife's like, well, who is that? What is that? I remember when we started dating. I remember telling my dad, I remember sitting in the kitchen telling my dad, I believe this is the one that God wants me to marry. I remember getting married. I mean, it was just, you could, you'll not find anyone else that loves his wife more than I do. I mean, I love my wife. I remember we found out 12 and a half years, well, 13 years ago on my birthday that we were going to have a baby. 13 years ago, I remember, on my birthday, we found out. I remember I went to the doctor's office that, that, that first time for the ultrasound and heard the heartbeat and thought, that's mine. That's my child. And then I remember going to the doctor's office and finding out he was a boy. Now, you'd have to understand, in my family, my grandfather taught that if you did not have a boy first, you were not a real man. And when I found out I was having a boy, I thought, my goodness. And when he was born, and then when Mariah was born, and then when Grace was born, they all filled my heart with joy. The the relationship I have with my wife fills my heart with joy. And if we're not careful, we can let the love or the pleasure of a spouse or the love or the pleasure of a child get in our way between us and Christ. I've seen it happen too many times. I have watched a parent have a child and say, we want to give this child everything they want. Baseball and basketball and football or whatever it may be. Scouts and this and that. And they sacrifice time with God for time with recreation with the child. And by the time the child becomes a teenager, it's too late. You just can't get it. It's, just, it's not that easy unless God just comes in just like that. And many times there are those in the church house and in the world alike that have replaced their love for God with the love for something or someone else. But this is not what I find in the church at Ephesus. That's not what it says about them. Does it say that they were in love with sin? No, it doesn't say they were in love with sin. Does it say they were in love with things? No, it doesn't say they were in love with things. It doesn't say that they were in love with pleasure. But I believe we can see three things that they're in love with. The first thing that we can see, I believe, is that they are in love with service. The Bible says that you have been busy, you have been productive, you have been doing, 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 doing. Now I'm going to give you a great example. It is our job to love the shepherd, not the shepherding. I'm a pastor. Now I love pastoring. I absolutely, I say I love I love 
almost 99% of pastoring. There are some times when I have to be involved in meetings that I don't want to be involved in. There are times when I have to deal with things that I don't want to deal with. There are times when I have to say things that I don't want to say. And if I was in love with pastoring and not in love with the Savior, when those hard times, when those difficult times, when those times that I don't want to have to deal with come into my life, I'd quit. And many times people quit because they're not in love with the Savior, but they're more in love with the service. They are in love with the service. They are in love with their steadfastness. These are the faithful ones, the ones that have been there. I go to churches for revivals. I go to churches because sometimes I get to preach. I go to churches for... I, I'm involved in different religious activities, and I have people come up to me many times when I enter into a church, and the first thing they want to tell me is, I've been here for... X amount of years. You know what I enjoy? When somebody else tells me that they've been there for X amount of years. These people are in love with their self or in love with their steadfastness. They're in love with service. They're in love with steadfastness. They're in love with the self-denial of wickedness. Now this is somebody... Now listen, you say, well, this, there's nothing wrong with, with pointing out sin. No, there's nothing wrong with pointing out sin, but there's everything wrong with loving to point out sin. There are those that find their specialty in letting everyone else know where they're wrong. I'll give you a great example. There's a church up north. I don't even know their name. I can't remember their name. I, I've, I've, I've witnessed them on the news. And what they'll do is when there's a funeral for a, a war veteran that's died or when there's something going on, they'll protest and stand out and they'll use vulgar language and they'll, they'll, they're quick to point out the sin of the others instead of the love of God. We're getting ready to have a message, not this Sunday, not next Sunday night, but the next Sunday night on how it is our duty to love the sinner. It is our duty to love the sinner. And there are those who are caught up in their love of letting everybody else know what's wrong. This is their problem, okay? Okay. They've let the love of something else get in their way of the love of God. And what did God, what did Jesus Christ tell them? He said, hey, if you cannot get right, if you cannot repent, if you cannot love me supremely, then I am going to come and I'm not just going to remove it from your families, from your children, I'm going to remove your church from Ephesus. And last week we talked about the removal of that candlestick, but I want us to look at the cost of moving the candlestick. I want us to look at the cost of that candlestick being moved. Number one, the first cost of the candlestick being removed is that we will lose the presence of God. The Bible says in the first couple of verses that, that Jesus Christ is there, what? In the midst of the candlesticks. Now we love, we love to tout the verse where two or three are gathered together. We love it. And I believe this morning that Jesus Christ met with us this morning. I believe it. If you didn't feel it, then I'm sorry. But I'm going to tell you what, I was feeling it. And it made me a little happy about feeling it. Because it made me know that he's still here. I'm reminded of the story in the book of Judges about Samson. Everybody knows who Samson is, right? We all know who Samson is. We learned about Samson in Sunday school. The Bible says that Samson is set apart for God from his birth, that a razor shouldn't touch his head. The Bible says that when he would go and do mighty works like tearing walls down or tying the tails of foxes together and setting them on fire and, and basically beating men to death with the jawbone of a donkey, one man, Tearing the jaw of a lion apart. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not up for trying that. But what did the Bible say? The Bible said every time that happened, that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. That the Spirit of the Lord was on him. We find Samson, he begins to take a trip down the, 
to the Philistines and he meets a woman by the name of Delilah. We all know that name too. The Bible says that Samson found himself with his head in the lap of Delilah. The Bible says that Delilah would come to him and say, Samson, why don't you tell me the power of your strength? And he'd say, well, do this. The Philistines would come, he would break loose, and he would, he would get away. Delilah would say, well, why don't you tell me, Samson? He'd tell her something else in the same effect. Finally, Delilah looked at him and she used these words. Samson, if you loved me, if you loved me, you'd tell me the source of your strength. Samson said, if you shave my head, I'll become as other men. I do not believe this happened because Samson saved his head. I believe it happened because Samson left the dedication and the love that he owed to God. The Bible says that she said, The Philistines be upon you, Samson. It says Samson got up and he wished not that the Lord was not with him. He didn't even know. And I believe all throughout churches today, throughout America, they don't even know that the Spirit of God is not even with them. I believe that Christians all around don't even know that the Spirit of God has turned His back and He's saying, you have left me. You see, the first cost of leaving our love is we lose the presence of God. We need the presence of God. We need it in our lives. We need it. My family needs it. Your family needs it. This church needs to experience the presence of God. It was that very presence of God that pointed me to salvation. The first cost is we lose the presence of God. The second cost, we lose the power to be effective illuminators in this dark world of sin. The Bible says this, that the candlestick will be removed. That means that that light is extinguished. Now the Bible says that when Jesus was on this earth that we are called the light of the world. Our job as Christians is to illuminate the world to their sin and their need to a Savior. That's our job. I was talking to a fellow this week. He called me up. He said, uh, hi, I'm from such and such church. He's from a church in Greensboro. I won't say the name. He said, I've been watching your live stream services. You never know who's watching. I, I, you just never know. He said, I've been watching your live stream services, and I want to know I want to know how you do it because we want to do it. I said, well, just stop by. I'll show you. It's not difficult. It's very simple. We try to do as much as possible as little as possible. And I said, just stop by. And I was talking to him, and I was talking to him about the church, and he said, we're a church. He said, our average age in our church is 70 years old. And uh, he said, now, we're, 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 we run about 65, 85 people on Sunday, but our average age is about 70 years old. He said, but we want to get the young people in. He said, we want to get the young families in. We want to have families in. And I told him this. He asked me, he said, do you use contemporary music? Do you have a contemporary service? I said, brother, we do not have a contemporary service, and we do not use contemporary music. I said, here's what you're finding. I said, my generation has walked away from God. My generation has turned their back on God, and they don't really want much to do with God. I said, the generation under me, therefore, is even farther away from God. I said, the way these churches are drawing people in is through entertainment and through emotion. What do I mean by that? They bring in the music that is loud, that attracts the flesh, the lights that attract the flesh, the songs that attract the flesh, and it entertains them. And so therefore they come in and they, they get entertained. I said on the other side they get emotions. They build it up. They leave church and they come back because they say, I feel good when I leave that church. Can I say this? I want you to feel good, but I want you to feel good after you make a decision at the end of the service. I don't want you to feel good because I told you how great a person you were. I want you to feel good because you know you're living according to the Word of God. 
we will never, as long as I'm here, build this church on entertainment. I'm not going to do it. It's not going to happen. We will, you will not see me try to drum up some emotion. Now, if the Spirit of God touches your heart and it makes you emotional, that's right. But I'm not going to drum it up. There's too much of that going on. So what do we have to have? What's going to convince the young people and the families and the people that what we have is right and holy and according to God's Word? What's it going to take? The power of a holy and righteous God. We must have the power of God upon our families, upon our personal lives, and therefore when we congregate together as a group of people with the power of God, the church therefore will have the power of God upon it. It will never happen if we are walking away and leaving our first love. You say, well, people just aren't getting saved. People aren't, just aren't interested anymore. You know why? Because we have churches full of people who have something they love more than Jesus Christ. The first cause is that we lose His presence. The second cause is that we lose His power. And the third cause is that we lose our future. What do I mean? Well, He said, I'll remove the candlestick. I'll take it away. What does the Bible say? How do we get saved? Faith cometh by what? Hearing. And hearing by what? The Word of God. The Bible also says in that chapter, How shall they hear? Now, I don't know about you, but when I got saved, somebody told me about Jesus Christ. I didn't catch it from a sign in the sky. A person told me that Jesus loved me, that Jesus wanted to save me, that Jesus died for me. Now, imagine a church that's no longer here. How are my great-grandchildren? How are my grandchildren? Now, my children have grown up with it, and I expect my three children to tell their children. But where are they going to go if the churches begin to close their door? You say, Pastor, that will never happen. In America, we're founded on Christian principles. In America, let me show you something, okay? The church of Ephesus, the seven churches that the letter's written to are the seven churches of Asia Minor, which are in modern-day Turkey. Turkey is one of the epicenters of Asia for Christianity during that day and age. America's how old? Well, let's see, 2084, 2089 will be 300 years old. 2076 would just be 300 years since we declared independence. We didn't actually win that war for a few more years. 300 years. America's not even 300 years old. Okay, The church at Ephesus was there for three to four hundred years. Turkey is there the modern day. Now we know because of the Ottoman Empire that Turkey has been conquered by Islamic, uh, the Islamic regime. Okay? It is currently under Islamic dictatorship. There are 80 million people in Turkey today. 80 million. Only 300 and 20,000 of those 80 million are professing Christians. And out of that, that includes Roman Catholicism, Greek Orthodox, and Armenianism. Very, very few of them. Now, I'm not saying there's not any that are saved in that. But very few of them believe the way we believe. That is about 0.04% Christianity in a country that was the epicenter of Christianity. You say, it can't happen here. It can't happen here. Can I share another statistic with you? Every year, six to 10,000 churches in America close their door. Six to 10,000 churches. One out of every seven pastors is under 40. The remainder of them are over 40 years old. The average age in America of a church goer is over 50 years old. You see, I say this. It's not that it will happen, but that it already has begun to happen. 
It's already begun. Six to ten thousand churches a year. Can we keep up in America with Christianity with that many churches closing each year? That's the bad news. The good news is, is that Jesus said, if we repent, if we repent, if we go back to that first love, you see, here's the amazing thing about a candle. The wick goes all the way through to the bottom. And here's the amazing thing about it is that even, let's put it in their modern term, even if they're using an oil lamp, the oil can't run out and the wick will never run out. And if we will repent and if we will get back to our first love, all it takes is a little bit of cleaning up of that wick and the fire of God to light it back up. And I believe we can see God do some amazing, amazing, amazing things. I believe it. I believe it. I told the same gentleman that called, I said, listen. I said, I know it looks tough. I know it looks dark. I know it looks hard. I know it looks awful. And I know it looks like the world is against us. I said, but God placed us here during this day. And if He placed us here, He gave us the ability to successfully thrive. I believe it. But I do not believe it will happen while we have our eyes on all the things of this world. It's this. It's easy. How easy is it to love something that you can put your fingers on, your hands on, your eyes on, compared to something you've never seen? Now, I hope you felt it. I hope that you felt it within your heart. But it's easy to just let something else take over because there's no space that it takes up. That automobile takes up a space. That house takes up a space. That child, it takes up a space physically in your life. That spouse, it takes up a space in your life. Whatever That job, it takes up a space. But Jesus Christ is standing there and He's saying, You left me. I've never left you. I've never forsaken you. You've left me. He says, Go ahead and repent. Get right. Come back to me. Listen, I don't know one of us that would say, I don't want to come to church and not feel the presence of God. I've been in church services that way where I've come in and it's been dead and the people not even know it. I mean, they just didn't even know it. They're just clueless. It's sad. You walk in, you think, what is going on? There's something, something missing. Something's missing. It's the Spirit of God. I don't know one of us that want to continue to live in a life that does not have the power of God upon it. We need it. And I don't know a one of us that would purposely send our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, or great-great-grandchildren to hell. But if we refuse to love Him correctly, that's exactly what we're doing. Please stand. I'm finished. Every head bowed, every eye closed. As musicians come this way, I don't know where your heart may be this morning. As they come this way, they're going to begin to play softly and sing softly. Every head bowed, every eyes closed. I want to ask this question this morning as they begin to play. If you're in here today, how many of you would raise your hand and say, Preacher, I know without a, doubt, a shadow of a doubt that I'm born again. I've been saved. I'm a Christian. Would you raise your hand and say, Preacher, I'm a Christian. I know I'm saved. I see those hands. Would you in here today... Raise your hand and say, Preacher, I don't know that I'm a Christian. Would you pray for me? Would you raise your hand and just say, Preacher, I just need prayer. I'm not asking you to come down. I just want you to raise your hand. How many of you today would say, Preacher, I know there's something in my heart that I love a little bit more than I should. Would you raise your hand and say, Preacher, there's something there that I love a little bit more than I should. I see those hands. How many, let's put it this way. How many of you would say this? Preacher, I don't love Jesus Christ as much as I can. 
Would you raise your hand? The altars are open. Why don't you come and ask for this? Jesus, help me to love you more. Every Christian could get on their knees this morning and pray that prayer. Help me to love you more. Amen. Don't hesitate. Do you love him the way you should? Is there something in your life? Do you love sin? Do you love pleasure? Do you love the things of this world? Are you in love with service? Are you in love with self? What are you in love with more? Is there something in your life? Or maybe, maybe your love is just a little cold. Whatever your need may be this morning. Amen. I'm going to ask Brother Randy to come up here and at least lead us in one verse of that song. I've had that song on my heart all week long, and I think it'd be good to sing it. And then when he's done, I'm going to ask Brother Earl if you'll close us in prayer. Thank you for being here. I, I look forward to seeing you tonight. 496. Let's sing that first stanza. Since I found in him. 